tradition of success of these literary evenings is very much due to our dear friend Paul Moore, who I'm delighted to say is here this evening, who was a long time convener of the literary evenings here in the club. Now tonight, uh, I'm delighted that we welcome not one but two authors, and they are uh, Harry Martin and Cormac O'Malley. Cormac, of course, knows, needs no introduction. He has spoken here in the club before about his father, Ernie O'Malley. And if anyone who saw the recent documentary on RTE, uh, Call to Arts, uh, you will see how important uh, Ernie O'Malley and indeed his wife, Helen Hooker, were to the uh, cultural and artistic development of the nascent Irish nation back in the 1920s, 30s and 40s and, and, and right the way through. And I'm delighted that Cormac has really uh, very much been the, the, the keeper of the flame, as, a, as it were, for his father and mother's legacy. And uh, anyway, again, again, if you watch that documentary, you would have seen the extraordinary life that Ernie O'Malley led both as a revolutionary soldier, as a TD, and of course as a very famous and esteemed writer. So it's fitting that his, uh, the recently uh, published uh, biography is simply called Ernie O'Malley, A Life, and it has been co-authored by Cormac and by Harry Martin. Now, while we have both speakers here this evening, they have agreed among themselves that it'll be Harry that will speak to us this evening and introduce Harry. I'm delighted that we have Cormac O'Malley. Cormac. Uh, thank you very, uh, very much indeed. Can I take this off? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, yes, yeah, pleasure to be back here and speaking on my on my feet. Uh, just on the side, if you haven't seen a little plug for RTE and a call to arts, I gather it's on player. I don't know quite what that means, but you go to RTE and you can hit player and you can go down and see a call to arts if you if you haven't seen it. It was a it was my homage uh, to my parents and their. Journey in the artistic uh, world of, of Ireland in the 30s and 40s. But uh, th this evening is a different matter. It's on the literary side. And um, I just, uh, uh, I've had these uh, last uh, couple of years working with Harry Martin, who is a, um, a dear friend from our, this town in which I now live in Stonington, Connecticut. And um, just to tell you a little bit about Harry. Uh, he, the most important thing I think that uh, comes out from Harry is that his grandfather Dominic was from Galway. And of course, uh, uh, being from Mayo, uh, myself, uh, Galway is, uh, well, we, we're very proud of Galway being from the west of Shannon. But um, uh, Harry has a inherited from his Galway this fierce uh <coughs> spirit of sort of uh, vi vitality. And it's um, what we, in America, you'd call the litigation style, the barristerial style. And um, I think he, uh, it's a force of nature. And uh, that's what Harry is. And when he got to Harvard, he sailed through Harvard and Harvard Law School. He went into a prestigious uh, law firm in, in uh, Wall Street. He carried on and, and transitioned into diplomacy with the United States uh, International Aid Program in Latin America. Then he started to climb the corporate uh, ladder in banking and became CEO of a Merrill Lynch bank in London. And uh, not having been satisfied with that, he went on to run a, an Arab bank cons consortium in New York. And um, uh, later on then provided financial uh, advice and planning to uh, some of the top American private families. So Harry was looking for something else to do at age 81. And uh, um, he decided to become a, a writer. And uh, the, the real thing is Harry has become a writer because uh, he suffered through a lot with me. Uh, but I was delighted, uh, not at his suffering, but at the energy which we brought to, uh, to this uh, um, uh, uh, project. And um, he brings such a passion, which is sometimes hard to control, but we managed to get it through uh, the eye of the needle of publishers and editors and various other matters that you do in order to, uh, to get a, a, a book out. Um, and uh, uh, so there we have, we have Harry Martin uh, to bring you the story of Ernie O'Malley.
after that dubious introduction, there was too much about the author and too little about the subject. Now, as we go over his life, I just have two caveats in the beginning. Number one, he's a controversial man, and some of you feel strongly, perhaps, that he, violence was never necessary. I'd be delighted to have those questions at the end. And number two, it gets awfully awkward with the slides, so if the right slide isn't there where I'm talking, just wait for it. Now, biographers fall in love with their subjects. I had always wanted to be a warrior and a writer, and when I got to know s th this fellow in Stonington, who, by the way, is the leprechaun of our town, I realized he had this incredible archive a separate house devoted to his father's work. And people like Richard English, who wrote the early biography, had been staying there. But I, as I looked at all this stuff, I could see all the material that had never been used before. There were biographies, and there were, were notes of Ernie, and letters, and notebooks. And all of a sudden, we discovered something else, that Cormac had come to Ireland, when he was just a young man and in 1970 interviewed many of Ernie's comrades who talked directly about them. And I'm going to give you some of that. But the real essence of this talk is not just the history that all of you have lived through that's formed your country, but this unusual man. How could someone be such an incredibly effective combat leader and also be an incredible writer and intellectual, and also be so inept as a husband. And all of you ladies know that when you get married, you know more about that young man than he'll ever understand about himself, and he knows little about you, and that's part of this story as well. Ernie was brought up by his parents, Luke and Marion Malley, in Castlebar, County Mayo. He had 10 siblings, imagine 11 children. His father was a respected officer in the government system where Irishmen basically supported the English government. When he was nine, his parents moved to Dublin and he was sent to the Christian Brothers School. Now, that was a memorable time for him because all of a sudden, there were these teachers who taught about the fact that England had taken everything from Ireland, taken its freedom, its religion in some cases, its ability to speak its own language, its ability to own its own land. And these lads in school were incited by this theory that Ireland had to fight for its freedom, and Ernie carried that with him the rest of his life. <coughs> so as a young man, <coughs> he was an organizer, and now we're going to see, as a young man of about 20, th th during the rising in 1916, here he is in this very conservative household, he climbs out the window. I've seen the back of the house, and you can see where you can get down the window and on a roof. And with, with another young man with a rifle, they started firing on the British troops sent in to quell the rising. And then he was sent by Collins and Mulcahy, <coughs> no military training, he wasn't a university graduate, to organize and train units all over Ireland to be ready to fight the Brits, to basically get the arms they needed. They had no weapon. And the British had anywhere from 20,000 to 60,000 troops in barracks all over the country, fully armed. Then we had the Royal Irish Constable Group with another, I don't know, 20,000. And here this rabble of lads coming out of houses in the countryside were going to confront this massive military force, take enough of its weapons so it could effectively fight them to a truce. That's what he did. Now, these are the counties he was sent to. And when he went to these counties, he didn't know any of the people. By this time, he had been, uh, his family had gone to Dublin. He was a university boy. He had a different accent. <coughs> he was always an intellectual. And the elders thought that he was some madman sent to bring their children into violence and difficulty. 
he often had to sleep on the floor of a, of a country place somewhere. He had no water to, to wash in. He didn't have an arm that worked. He didn't have a firearm that was effective. He went by bicycle from county to county. And look at all the counties. First he went to the north, to Donegal, and then those are the counties w w in, in the dark. Uh, okay, this one's later, so I'm going back. All right, so <coughs> when Cormac talked to his father's comrades, and this was 70, so we're talking 50 years before, um, Sean Lamas, later prime minister, told Cormac what made Ernie such an exceptional military leader. Quote, Ernie had daring characteristics. His gap between decision and action was very small. Leading men in actual combat, he'd be excellent. He'd inspire them to do things that they would otherwise not attempt. That's the essence of a combat leader. He had exceptional organizational ability. That's rare to have those two qualities together. He wrote detailed commands to every soldier, 10 to 20 a day. Peter O'Connell, and by the way, forgive me if I pronounce some Irish names incorrectly. Um, Peter O'Connell described Ernie's behavior before the IRA raid on the Bally Train barracks in February 1920. Quote, Ernie marched through town wearing two guns openly <coughs> while the IRIC tried to avoid him. They were in control, the, uh, the, the, the constable people. Someone said, what a strange thing that is to do. Ernie said, quote, well, it's good for the morale of the people to see an IRA man walk around fully armed. The local battalion commander, who probably was 45 or 50, Ernie's 22 or 3, said, <coughs> it may be good for the people's morale, but it was damn bad for mine. Okay, his exceptional, this isn't to talk about all the things he did. I'm just going to mention a couple. W with Liam Lynch in Cork, he took over the Mallow Barracks from a British Lancer regiment by himself with a few men and captured all the arms. <coughs> um, he had about 10 men trying to kill him and his aide, uh, Jerry Kiley, uh, somewhere in North Cork. He shot five or six of them. Now, the, uh, there was another interesting thing about Ernie. They call him a gunman, and you've all heard that. In the beginning of his military career, <coughs> he was confronted by an IRC guy who was going to arrest him. And Ernie felt that, uh, Ernie had a pistol too. He felt that it was proper for him to wait for the other man to fire first. Now, if any of you have been in the military, the idea of waiting until the enemy fires at you is ludicrous. So he didn't start out as a killer at all. There was another case where some IRC guys are walking by and he's behind stone walls and his men all have shotguns. He couldn't bear to tell his men to fire. His men were disgusted. So he started with this unusual combination of total courage, but this inclination to kill. <coughs> okay, what motivated and empowered a g kid of 20 to become this sort of leader. Why did he leave his family at 19 to be an organizer and later becoming a combat leader? Was he trying to be a man? Was he trying to outdo his older brothers, both of whom were, were in the British Army? None of this interested him. How did he operate in distant counties without direction or support from his superiors? <coughs> How did he go on training men in the countryside when he was regarded as a hostile force? Unlike men, <coughs> he was not motivated by customary human desires. Now, there's recently been some articles about what constitutes a hero. One of the things that constitutes a hero is that he's not doing it for his own power and aggrandizement. The other thing that constitutes a hero is that he doesn't know he's being one at the time. He just does it. 
once he believed in his cause, he did anything to achieve it, suffered any indignity, endured any slight. And now we've gone through the War of Independence and we're in July 1921, and we're coming to the truth. Ernie and Liam Lynch are leading the first and second divisions, southern divisions in, in, in Munster, in the southern area. <coughs> they have between them probably 80% of all the IRA troops able to fight. <coughs> and all of a sudden, <coughs> with no notice whatsoever, and all of you who have run an organization knows that if you don't tell your people what's happening and why, and they're bewildered, and they can't trust you to inform them, they begin to go their own way. And this is what happened with Liam Lynch and Ernie. <coughs> Mulcahy and Colin told them nothing about the truce. They invited Tom Barry so they could understand the strength, but Barry did not tell Lynch. And so all of a sudden, these two young commanders of 80% of the IR forces receive a notice directly signed by Mulcahy and Collins <coughs> that in the middle of July, lower arms, no more fighting. They had no idea why. Now, <coughs> why was this important? It was important because when the treaty came six months later, <coughs> they didn't have the knowledge, these lads, to understand that they could never beat the Brits out of Ireland. I mean. Britain had an enormous army just demobilized from the First World War that it could have sent over. They didn't understand the British colonial system. They didn't know that India was a much more important colony than Ireland, and that if the Brits gave Ireland freedom, we had India out there. So they resisted the truce. They went along with it, but they didn't agree with it. And then this is one of the key points of my talk to you. When the treaty came along, <coughs> a few hotheads, and now we're gonna go to the next slide. All right. Now, these, the, the areas in dark are the Republican areas. It looks like they're dominant. Not at all. This is where all the force was. And what happened in the, s in the beginning <coughs> of the treaty negotiations was that Lynch and Ernie had never got any notice whatsoever about the bigger issues that really meant that they <laughs> couldn't go on fighting Britain and that it made sense to take the deep concessions like bringing all the troops out of Ireland. And <coughs> So we go through a period from the treaty of December 21 to the four court situation in June of 22, where a few of the die hard young men, these two down here have all the troops, a few of the others are resisting and they're going to fight the free state. The free state is established, it's able to pay its people, it has the support of the church, it has the support of most of the industry, and it has the new support of most of the Irish people who formerly supported the Republicans fighting for their freedom. And in any revolution you look at, if you look at China, anywhere, it's the people that support the irregulars who can take on the large armies. And once the people go against you and you're fighting your own countrymen, and they have the transportation, they have the infrastructure, they have the church, they have business, you don't have a chance. And in, <coughs> by August 1922, the Four Courts was over on June 30. By the way, I get as excited about this talking to you as I did when I first learned about it. Because here are these two young men, they really could have controlled the whole thing, Lynch and, and Ernie, <coughs> and they're in, it's, it's June 30 uh, of 22, and, and Ernie has to surrender the four courts, okay? He doesn't have a chance. Within six weeks, the Free State Army, and now ironically and tragically, 
their leader, probably the greatest figure in the War of Independence, Michael Collins, <coughs> is in charge of the Free State Army, and Mulcahy is in charge of the government. And these two young lads, these, they are revolutionaries, <coughs> don't understand that by the time Limerick City fell and the Kilmalock Triangle just north of Cork fell and most of the coastal ports fell, they didn't have a chance to win the Civil War. Not a chance in hell. And they should have surrendered right then. And why was that important? Because there's another interesting aspect about both these conflicts. Um, <coughs> 202, about 2,500 people perished in the War of Independence from 1919 to 1921. About 2,500 or 3,000 people perished in the Civil War from June 22 to May 23 and a little longer. That's 5,000 people. Let's make a comparison of other civil wars. About a million people perished when Mao took on the Chinese. 500,000 people perished in Spain in its civil war. 750,000 Americans perished in their civil war. And 39,000 Finns in a war you may never have heard of from 1918 to 1921 perished. So why are we making so much of the Irish Civil War? Because this is a small country and we wouldn't have had, the, had they surrendered in September of 22, after they realized what had happened, that the Free State Army was so strong and they were so weak and they didn't have the, the people supporting them, <coughs> if they had surrendered then we wouldn't have had the executions in December and November of Erskine Childers, of Rory O'Connor, of Liam Merlows, of Barrett. None of these, those five leaders of the, uh, the IRA would not have been executed. I think another 117 people were executed or died in prison. And by the end of the Civil War, Ireland had been divided the way America was. And by the way, our Civil War ended in about 1868. It's still going on. Come to America and look what's happening in the South compared to the North with basic stuff like vaccines and we are still fighting our Civil War so much later. So Civil Wars create an, a wound to the country that's lasting and that's why uh, I believe that it's a tragedy that Mulcahy and Collins, who really understood the worldly picture much better, didn't help these young men understand that it made no sense when the Irish College came to Ernie in September for Ernie to say, we're fighting on, forget it. And another thing that motivated these young men to go on fighting so long was that their people were being treated badly by the Free State, all right? The IRA had been treated badly by the British. The IRA treated, uh, the IRA I think executed 67 Irish civilians in Munster mostly. Civil wars are horrible creatures of agony for a people. So if they had ended it in September, I think Ireland would have been much better off. All right, so now we leave the warring period and I'm delighted to say that this man who was known to all of us because he ran out of the Humphreys house, a hundred uh, free state soldiers surrounding it with a weapon in each hand firing, shouting no surrender here, he's wounded nine times shot to the body. Imagine getting rifle shots to your body nine times. He goes on for two and a half years in the prison. He goes through a 21 day hunger strike. He never gives up. That's another thing about a hero. He isn't doing it for his own position. He doesn't know he's a hero. And number three, he never gives up, never. 
So he comes out of prison. He's one of the last people released by the Free State because if they let him out early, he might have brought the IRA back again. So he's 20 months in prison after the, the ceasefire of May 1962, or, or rather 22. He comes out with a few other lads, and he comes into an island which no longer recognizes his heroism, which basically is tired of the violence, which wonders why these young men went on fighting. He has no prospects, he has no money, he goes to his family house and his father is terribly angry because he's ruined the family. Now most men would have done something like his comrades did. They went to America, they, get, they just went on with their lives. Not Ernie O'Malley, okay? What Ernie O'Malley did was he went to Europe, he saw, he, and all, all this time lingering in this wild warrior, is a deep intellectual. Those characteristics don't go together all the time. So he goes to Europe and he has some fascinating experiences because the, the, uh, his uh, friend, uh, um, Maud Guns and McBride's son, John McBride, Sean McBride is living in Paris and Colonel Lacasse from the French Surete, the, the intelligence unit, comes to see young McBride who's living there. He says, by the way, what is your friend uh, Ernie O'Malley doing here? And McBride said, he's not doing anything. Colonel Lacazzi said, ha ha, you're a nice boy, but let me tell you, he's the military advisor to the Basques and the Catalans, and there's a Catalan unit here in Paris. They're going to take the train this Saturday, go down and capture Spain. Please dissuade the young man from this folly. So even though he was no longer a general and a hero, this aspect of his life went with him forever. So he comes back to Ireland. He, he gives up his medical studies, more or less. And all of a sudden, his past comes back again because De Valera appoints Frank Aiken and Ernie to go to the United States to raise money for the free Irish press. So over they go, uh, and at this point he's, let me see, 20, this is 1928, so he's 31, okay. And let's see, what the, isn't it a shame when you get older, you only have to put on glasses to read, which I'm going to do right now. Ah, he goes to New York City, um, and a local paper reports on one of his events. Quote, this was one of the most fashionable social Irish events ever held in New York City, joined by all the prominent Irishmen. The Grand March was led by Ernie O'Malley, the Irish Republican leader. When he entered the hall, the band played the soldier's song, and all the audience joined the singing. How did this funny kid from Mayo get to the point where everybody in the room in New York stood up and sang with him? Okay, and now another thing he's doing, this eternal ability to survive and never give up goes with him. So as he's going across with Aiken, and, and they met their goal of raising the money, he's meeting with intellectuals. He wasn't an intellectual before, was he? He hasn't written a book yet. He hasn't done anything. And he meets with the leading intellectuals of America. He meets with John Ford, the, the movie director in California. He meets with <coughs> the photo pho photographers, e Edward Weston. And then he has, somebody drives him down to the artist colony. And do we have it there? There she is. Mabel Dodge Luhan in New Mexico, in Taos had created a colony uh, with D.H. Lawrence and his wife. Um, all of these wonderful characters are down there. Georgia O'Keeffe, the painter, Ella Young, you may remember the Irish writer. They introduce Ernie to the 
local Indian tribes. Ernie becomes an expert on the Indians. And then he goes to Mexico where these are people that he's never met before. He may have the entree of being a general, but this is what all of them happened to all of them. They all somehow created an intimate, close relationship with the red-haired Irishman. Here is Hart Crane, a uh, great American poet. Uh, he went to live, Ernie went to live with Hart Crane and the novelist Catherine Ann Porter. Crane wrote of his visit. This shows you why he was able to link up with them so quickly. <coughs> Quote, I have the most pleasant literary moments with the Irish revolutionary, a quiet, the most quiet and appreciative person I've ever met, Ernest O'Malley by name. We drink together, look at frescoes, and agree. And during this time, his love of art and his insight came out. For example, he, he was studying Diego Rivera and Jose Clemente Orozoco. Most people think that Rivera is the greatest fresco painter. He isn't. Ernie picked this out. Then he goes back to New Mexico with Helen Golden. He always had older women who supported him, and uh, they were his muses. Erskine Childers' wife, Molly, was one of them, the couple that brought the German rifles into Houth in, in uh, 1912. And, and, and these ladies kept supporting him and helping him. <coughs> so he goes back, and he has to he has swim across the Rio Grande River because he's lost his visa. So then Paul Grand, one of the great American uh, photographers, recommends him to all his friends in New York. So here again we have the young Irishman, unknown. By this time he's never written or published anything. He returns to New York City. He's invited to complete his memoirs at Yadu, a creative colony. <coughs> and here are some of the Americans who went to that colony. Truman Capote. Leonard Bernstein, James Baldwin, ever hear of them? And Ernie is right there, they were after him. And he's been writing the two books, the, the most famous books he writes, On Another Man's Wound, about the War of Independence. How many here have read On Another Man's Wound? Oh, you've got a great read. I, as I was writing this book, Cormac used to say to me, why in the world are you quoting my father all the time? I said, he can write a hell of a lot better than I can. Read on another man's wound, okay? It's a magnificent book. So <coughs> when he's in America, he finishes on another man's wound. He submits it. By now, he's got all these creative, James Johnson Sweeney, the museum director, all these people supporting him. And they think he's wonderful. He's starving. He can't make any money during the Depression. And he, he writes here, um, <coughs> I had to go to dinners to be able to feed myself. Last year, being so hard, I organized New York so I could be invited out to dinners at least four times a week. But they became mostly society functions, and I get sick of society people, so I decided it was better to be hungry. So he's sitting in New York, surrounded by the glamorous, creative people, no money, no future, nine publishers turn his book down, even though they all address him as General O'Malley. What is he to do? Well, number one, we can see now why Mulcahy and Collins were correct about the gradual evolution of freedom of Ireland that would happen after the treaty because by the mid-30s, De Valera is in charge of the government, and Ernie gets a disability and war pension, which is enough so he can propose marriage. Now, unfortunately, Ernie was the greatest combat leader. He wasn't the greatest suitor, okay? So what happens? There is a couple in New York, uh, Elon and Blanche Hooker, who's a very rich industrialist, uh, and they have four daughters, and they invite the most exciting young men in New York to their Greenwich mansion for a Sunday lunch. 
their youngest daughter, Blanchette, had just married the most eligible bachelor in America, um, <coughs> Rockefeller III, okay? So nobody has the pl place that he does. Another one marries John Marquand, one of the great American novelists. Two are single, and out comes Ernie, okay? So Ernie starts in having a battle with Elon Hooker, who's a conservative, because Ernie says how badly the U.S. has treated the American Indian. Now we come to Helen Hooker. Now forgive me, I'm always concerned about this fellow back there because this is his mother we're talking about, all right? Um, at 26, Helen Hooker know more about the world and men that Ernie, at, uh, or I say, tw no, she was 28. Ernie was 36. He never learned as much about women as she knew about men right then. She was totally independent. Uh, she refused to go to the schools like Vassar that her sisters went to. She had already traveled all over Europe and met with an exciting young American who was studying with Pavlov. She was a talented, she'd been junior tennis champion of America. Whew, and here she is. Does she look like a determined, independent, confident young woman? Wow. So having seen Ernie take her father on, she took Ernie by the arm, took him out to her sculpture studio, and, was, and then Ernie for two years courted her. And in the beginning, he would write, um, here we go, we're going back here. Oh, in the beginning he would write her sincerely yours and sign himself Ernest O'Malley. After a year and a half, she must have decided, she had lots of suitors, that for some reason he was the man. So then his letters began, let's see, Dear Pussycat, I feel warm inside when I think of you. That's all the news except to tell you that I love you is that news. God bless him. They marry in London. They set up housekeeping in Dublin. And they have a child fairly soon. And now a characteristic, which is going to hurt their marriage, begins. And that is Helen begins traveling by herself. I think the, the Cathal, the, the boy, the first child, came in late 36. And by 37, she's traveling for two months to London and gr back to Greenwich in New York, all by herself. And so Ernie writes, um, where is he here? I played with a baby, and this is, she's been gone for two months, and this is uh, the spring of 37, and Cathal was born in the fall of 36, or 35, Quote, I played with a baby and he's doing well. The house is very lonely without you. I don't know when you'll be back. Not when you say, I think. Okay, then they, in Ireland they decide to rent and then buy Burrishool, a lovely country house in Mayo. It's on Clue Bay in O'Malley country where the locals said, throw a stone and you'll hit an O'Malley. At first, country life is charming. Then when they begin farming, there are some nasty Welsh brothers nearby who threaten her when she's pregnant with her second child. And Ernie, who wants to be politic at that time and not be a celebrity anymore, instead of taking the, the Walsh brothers on, does nothing about it. She's hurt by this. Here's the hero husband. Why isn't he defending her? Okay, by 1944, Helen had enough of County Mayo and comes back and buys a house for the family in a <coughs> Dublin suburb. Now, other traits that, that were different. Here are two strong people fall in love, wonderful characters, little knowing that years later, their basic character and personality differences are going to make it impossible for them to have a successful marriage. By the way, this isn't a rare case. 
We're just talking about humanity. Um, so Helen, who's from a wealthy family, is a spendthrift, never worries about money. Ernie, growing up in his family, had to worry about every penny, and that troubles him terribly. An even more marriage, <coughs> important marriage element begins to go wrong. Ernie moves to a separate room because he reads late at night. Anyone here who has been through a first marriage and a divorce and uh, may now be in a blissful second marriage like I am knows that moving to a separate room for the man is not a good thing to do. And when Helen comes to see him to make up their quarrel by making love, Ernie insists that they have to have intellectual agreement before he's going to bed with her. What a disaster, right? Anyway, <coughs> again we see these incredible differing characteristics in him. This general, uh, uh, genuine hero, a deep intellectual who can write one of the best books, the best book on the warring period, who can be a best friend of Jack Yates, but a man who really doesn't understand at that point in his life, women. Okay, two houses away from their new house in Dublin lives Liam Redman and his family. He, he's a leading actor in Dublin and the leading actors form the theaters group. And the theaters group gives plays in Cork, in Dublin, and in London. And <coughs> Helen gets terribly excited and involved with this. She donates or, or invests a thousand pounds, which is a lot of money at that time. She spends a great deal of time as a designer of the costumes and the stage sets and she's in London and she's not at home all the time. 65 years later when I interviewed uh, Cormac's older brother Cathal about this period, Cathal said, quote, mother became involved with the Players Theater and no longer lived at home with us. I saw her every six months or perhaps once a year. Meanwhile, Ernie is going into his creative period where he's recognized by the world. <coughs> All right. We're going to skip over that and that one. He befriends Jack Yates. And by the way, there's a magnificent ex exhibit of Yates in your National Gallery we just saw today. <coughs> Becomes his friend. And typically of Ernie, has still has very little money in five installments buys Death for Only One, which sold for something like six or 700,000 euros a year or two ago. And then he, in, he not only befriends uh, Yates, but he befriends L Louis de Brokey, if I'm pronouncing that properly, Evie Hone. He helps Yates do his exhibition in Dublin and London at the Tate. And all of a sudden, Ernie is in the middle of the intellectual world of Dublin. He becomes book editor for the Bell. He speaks on the, the Irish radio on music from Africa, uh, the Middle East, the Orient. He becomes a, a Renaissance intellectual. And more important, finally, and now we're going back here, and well, we'll go back in a minute. Here we are with a family, and there they are in Burrishool. They go back and forth between Dublin and Burrishool. We see Helen and, and Ernie. We see little Cormac with red hair at that time. We see Etienne, who's their daughter, the, the, the second child, and Cathal, who's the older boy. And there they are at Burrishool. OK. <coughs> so. The marriage begins to deteriorate, and they just can't hold it together. And Helen, and again, this is a perfect example. Marriages don't break up because of one person, usually. They break up because of both people. Both people contribute. And they break up because the people's character and personality is so different. They just can't do it together. And so Helen tries to get a divorce. Ernie refuses. And Helen 
describes her feelings in a 1946 letter to Ernie, quote, perhaps you need to be alone the rest of your life, but I have already had to spend much of my life with you alone and without companionship of heart or act. That's so wonderful English. She's a heart or act. <coughs> so in 1948, Ernie takes the three children from the house in Dublin and brings them to uh, Burrishool. <coughs> Helen goes back to America. And now we come to something interesting that I discussed with one of you earlier, and that is that uh, under Irish law at that time, the mother could not take her own children out of the country without the written permission of the father. So she can't take the children back to Greenwich. She goes by herself, and they're all living with Ernie. <coughs> and an event occurred changing the lives of everyone in the family. Unknown to Ernie, Helen returns to visit the Redmonds in Dublin, and Mrs. Redmond had been very supportive of her. <coughs> Aided by Liam, she rents a car and drives to the boarding school in Waterford, where Ernie had put the two older children. He'd also warned the headmaster not to let them out of his sight. So when they all go to an inn for lunch, Liam, Helen, and the two older children, the headmaster goes with them. But when he goes to the loo for a moment, they spirit the children down to the car, they drive to Belfast, Helen's father has rented a private plane, they fly to southern France, Ernie has alerted the French authorities, but they're very clever. Instead of going to Paris where the French are waiting for them, they take a train to Marseille, and Helen and the children come back to New York. When she gets to the Park Avenue apartment, the reporters are out front. By this time, she's a famous person, and so is he, and they go in by the back entrance. So you can imagine, now we're going, I'm gonna go past this one to this one. And there, <coughs> and this is a deep family issue, there is Ernie and Cormac together in 1951. They were like bl blood brothers. And at one point, Ernie said, I only have one child, Cormac, and with his intelligence and courage, I hope he does something for his country. So they're living alone from 50 to 57 in Ireland, and the first four or five years, they're, they're in Burishool, and the children are brought back by Helen in 53. By that time, they haven't seen each other for three or four years, and they're like strangers. So what we have here is the, uh, an apparently tragic end of a life, but not really when I studied him. By that time, uh, the uh, On Another Man's Wound has been published both in London and in Boston, and the press refers to it as a stirring epic told without rancor or bad feeling, one of the great stories of our time. He's published a magnificent novel. He's brought this boy up, and he's respected. He has friends who put him up, and when Cormac and I were doing some research on this book and we drove from Dublin to Mayo, I remember you stopped by the road in, in Roscommon and said, I used to, well, I spent one summer down that road in a country house there. I said, why? He says, because my father, to protect me from being kidnapped, put me in different houses every summer during my vacation. So here we have a, a, a stirring story, a human story, a tragic story, and there's one really happy thing for Ernie in the last seven years, and that is John Ford. Now we go back here. There we go. John Ford makes The Quiet Man with John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara in Kong. I, I, I gather it's in County Galway right next to Mayo. And here we have Wayne.
Maureen and, and my friend Cormac here both have red hair. She sort of takes him up care of him on the set. Years later, when he's a young naval officer, she invites him to Hollywood where she's in a movie. And Ernie has simply a wonderful time helping with this film. And he also realizes at the end of his life that his sister takes him into her house in Howth. He has, by the way, these siblings of his are incredible. Uh, two of them become leading, three of them become leading doctors, and one of them who, as a youth, worked in the Civil War, uh, he, he had TB, so they cut his leg off, and he had a wooden stump, and he would carry messages in the Civil War. And that doctor helped Ernie at the end of his life with his health. So here we come to the end of his life in 1957. There we go. <coughs> I have never learned to pronounce the word for prime minister, so there is De Valera in the middle with Frank Aiken <coughs> and uh, Sean Lamas, three of the most important Irish political figures in the last 50 years. And Ernie had wanted nothing to do with notoriety at the end of his life. They insisted on giving him a state funeral where 300 servicemen fire a volley over the coffin and honor him. And if we go back in the, into the War of Independence, <coughs> two of the warlike men were very different. One was Ernie, who was reluctant to kill in the beginning, and the other one was <coughs> what one of you called a, a critical name, <coughs> Dan Breen. And during the funeral, Dan Breen had come all the way from Tipperary. No one had ever seen Dan weep before. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Do we have any questions about this interesting character? And I knew my friend, my new friend, the barrister, I knew he'd get up and have a good question. <coughs> Just to assist you, uh, two words. Uh, Taoiseach is the Taoiseach. Taoiseach, yep. And Taoiseach. the and uh, where he lived and where the funeral was was Hoth. Hoth is how we say it. <laughs> and by the way, here is the funeral party with with little Cormac, his brother and sister, etc. That's our last slide. He's buried in Glass Seven. Can I ask you one question? How long did it take you to write the biography with Cormac? Well, I thought I'd written a biography um, uh, in a year and a half, and there's a wonderful woman here in Ireland named Mary Feehan, uh, who, who runs Mer Mercier Press, and if you've been in the corporate world and you think you're a big writer and you try to write a book, you come to a rude awakening. So in a year and a half, Mary Feehan called, I'd sent her the manuscript, and she said, ah, would that be Harry Martin? And he thinks he's a writer now. I knew then it was all over, okay? Mm -hmm. She said, do you have the manuscript on your desk? Uh, I said, yes, I do. And do you have a waste bin beside the desk? Yes, throw in the waste bin and start all over again. So it took me about, it took us about three and a half years, okay? Three and a half. If any of you have not written a book and you start to write one, you're gonna realize how very difficult it is. Very good. <coughs> Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? We'll look Don't we there. have any constitutionalists who believe that this violence was never necessary and by natural evolution, Ireland would get its freedom? Come on. <laughs> I'm disappointed. Don't we have anyone who thinks these rash young men should never, that Wolf Tone in 1798, Robert Emmett in 1803, Robert Marr in 1848, the 16 men were all flailing around to no avail. I think 700 years of history possibly <laughs> mitigated against that. <laughs> Sir. Uh, this gentleman right here. I'm not a lawyer, but just an interest, uh, I'm interested to know what school did you take in Waterford? Um, Cormac, what was the school in Waterford? Ring College. Ring, Ring College. <coughs> Harry, I'm just looking at the photograph there. I think that's uh, President Sean T. O'Kelly. Yeah. 
in the foreground. Is it? <coughs> we'll be uh, there. He looks as if he was just wounded, doesn't he? <laughs> but of course, being a safe funeral would be, would the president will be there. Um, Eamon. When did what? When did the family leave oh, Barashul? Okay, that's a good question because what happened in 1951 after she took the children back to America, um, Helen was on the title. <coughs> she brought a lawsuit to evict <coughs> Cormac and um, his father from Barashul. And Cormac has shown me they lived in one room in this large country house with a little peat fire. <coughs> um, and she had the, it looked to me like she had a very good case, but when the case got to the high court, a draft opinion was written that this lady <coughs> had taken the children out of the jurisdiction, had, had left the marriage, and all of you who are solicitors or barristers or judges know, she came into a court of equity, and if you don't come into a court of equity with clean hands, you lose. So the judge held for Ernie and um, <coughs> his father, and they stayed in Burishul until about 1955, five years, and then they went to an apartment in Dublin, and that's basically where he was before he went to his sister's house early in 1957, just before he died. So they were there, she left in 50, they were there 50 to 55, r roughly, having survived this lawsuit. The man sitting beside you can answer that better <laughs> than I. <coughs> so they owned it up until his death, right. It was a very odd set of legal situations that went on, but again, here's a very human. The judge could very easily have held for Helen, right? He didn't. And Ernie, after the case, Nyack was the solicitor, I forget the name of the barrister, had a banquet at Borishul for the barristers and the, the uh, solicitor who represented him without cost. And it's in the book, it's one of the most wonderful menus, how he put it together because there was no running water, she shut the water off. And they lived there in a skeletal way but somehow got through. When you read this book, you realize that life is indeed more interesting and stranger than fiction. Can I ask, given that I he- I think this sorry. lady has a question. Sorry, madam. Well, the, the hunger strike went on uh, in November 20, Three, I remember, and it was 41 days, and Ernie had told his comrades, because he was still in a condition where he could barely walk, he'd been, you know, they bas everyone thought he was gonna die, and in fact, the, the, the one of the Irish newspapers reported that he had died. So he was very weak, but he insisted on going through the hunger strike, and during the hunger strike, he wrote a letter to Molly Childers, where he said, and this, curious thing that he related to the, the older women who protected him. He said, <coughs> you are like my mother, and all I can say is that going through the hunger strike brought me closer to God. So he, he survived the hunger strike, and then survived another six months it was in prison, and then came out. A broken man in some ways but a determined man who would recreate himself as an important creative intellectual. That's why he's such fun. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yes, sir. <coughs> Could, Could you repeat that question? I, I can't. <laughs> couldn't hear you then. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Okay. Well, listen, thank you, Harry, very much indeed for that extraordinary insight into, I mean, this picture is extremely telling when you see the president, the Taoiseach, and all the family members all assembled at a, at a state funeral, which is an extreme honor. Right. You know, I think it shows uh, that the, the state did, you know, uh, uh, value the contribution that Ernie made to the development of this country. And, um, and also, I, th I think the book is a valuable uh, contribution to uh, ensuring that his legacy is remembered and uh, both his, uh, all, all aspects of his life are remembered as well. So thank you very much indeed. And thank you all very much. For and ladies and gentlemen, uh, Harry, one sec, one sec, don't go, don't go, don't go. Uh, as is traditional here in the club, we show our appreciation uh, for our speaker and we have a little oh gift oh. for you, a little something to bring back to America. So there's a little something for you, my friend. So thank you very much indeed. I hope you enjoy that. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed this uh, lovely talk and show your appreciation once again for Harry Martin. Thanks again. And I hope you all enjoy your dinner. Thank you.